expectations can be powerful things. Sometimes we don't respond very well when we don't get the things that we expect. And I'm not just talking about small children who don't get the food that they wanted. In 1913, Igor Stravinsky, a Russian composer, premiered a new ballet in Paris called The Rite of Spring. If you're familiar with The Rite of Spring, you know that it's considered sort of a, a very uh, representative piece of 20th century sort of modernist uh, music with a lot of dissonance, and it sounds very unsettling. In fact, it was so unsettling that it caused a riot on the day that it premiered. Some of the patrons said that it sounded like the work of a madman. So it's not just small kids who get upset when they don't get what they expect. It can even be the well-heeled kind of people who go to see ballets in Paris. Today, I want to look at what can happen when we have wrong expectations for God. But before we get into the text that I want to look at this morning, I need to give a little bit of backstory um, with some Jewish history, so please bear with me. The Jews lived under a series of foreign pagan kings from the time of their exile and most of the time until the time of Jesus. The worst of these was undoubtedly a king based out of Syria, a Greek king by the name of Antiochus IV or Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus wanted his entire kingdom to have a sort of cultural, linguistic, and religious uniformity, and so he persecuted anybody who didn't practice Greek religion and Greek culture and speak Greek. And so he made it a capital offense for a Jew to have a copy of their scriptures, or even a part of a copy of their scripture. To try and force the issue, he desecrated Yahweh's temple in Jerusalem, offering a pig, an unclean animal according to Jewish law, on a temple or on an altar that he had erected in honor of the pagan god Zeus in the temple. This all happened in 164, sorry, 167 BC. This started a riot among uh, the Jews, and eventually a priestly family began a, a military campaign against Antiochus and his military presence in uh, Jerusalem. And in the year 164, they were able to defeat him and come into Jerusalem as victors who tossed out the foreign oppressors. Uh, the leader of this rebellion, Judas Maccabeus, he and his, his followers rededicated the Jewish temple, consecrating it for the worship of Yahweh. And Jews then, and Jews today, still celebrate that with the Feast of Hanukkah. Now, in your Bible, it may be called the Feast of Dedication. In the translation that I'm reading from today, the New Living Translation, it clarifies that that's Hanukkah. But if you see dedication, that's the same thing as Hanukkah. So just bear that in mind and read with me in John chapter 10, verses 22 to 30. It was now winter, and Jesus was in Jerusalem at the time of Hanukkah, the, the festival of dedication. He was in the temple walking through the section known as Solomon's Colonnade. The people surrounded him and asked, How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus replied, I have already told you, and you don't believe me. The proof is the work I do in my Father's name. But you don't believe me because you're not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me, for my Father has given them to me and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. So Jesus is cornered here and asked if he's the Messiah. Now, the question, as far as it goes, could be you know, one where they're trying to discern, are you indeed the Messiah so we can follow you? But that doesn't seem to be what's going on here. There's sort of an, a general air of hostility that shows that they're not looking to see if Jesus is the Messiah. They've already decided he isn't, but they, th they think that he might think that he's the Messiah, and they're looking for a basis to accuse him. And so Jesus answers sort of obliquely, basically saying, well, my works speak for me. Now, for Jesus, 
this is an important thing to do. He's, he's not trying to be deliberately evasive. He just understands that for him to say, yes, in fact, I am the Messiah, is both politically dangerous and actually kind of unhelpful and misleading. Because here's the thing. Politically, this would be dynamite. We have spiritualized the word Messiah and made it sort of a category of, of spiritual being. But to the Jews, Messiah meant king. It meant anointed one, and kings were anointed. And so for Jesus to claim to be a king while Israel is under Roman occupation would be an intensely political act. But there's more to it than that. You see, the whole expectation that people had around the Messiah had been given a sort of urgency and a sort of slant dictated by their present situation. The Jews once again found themselves dominated by a foreign oppressor. And so the Jews are looking, for, or looking back to Judas Maccabeus and his rebellion. And so their, their idea of a Messiah is backward looking trying to see what God has done in the past to deliver the people rather than forward-looking to what God might do now. And so Messiah, the, the label, has a lot of baggage attached to it that Jesus has no intention of fulfilling. So for him to say, yes, I am the Messiah, would lead the people that he's talking to to believe that Jesus is claiming to be something that he's not. He's not a second coming of Judas Maccabeus, this time here to kick out the Romans instead of the Greeks. Instead, Jesus is inaugurating a different sort of kingdom, and he is a different sort of king. The kingdom of God, or the reign of God, centers on the king who looks very different than the second coming of Judas Maccabeus. In Revelation, we see a glimpse into the heavenly throne room that hints at the difference between the kind of kingdom Jesus' contemporaries are looking for and Jesus is trying to inaugurate. In Revelation 7, 9 to 12, we read, After this I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. And they were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and elders and the four living beings, and they fell down before the throne with their faces to the ground and worshipped God. They sang, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. Notice how these people ascribe honor and glory to a lamb. A lamb is not a symbol of strength in most people's estimation. A lamb is a weak animal that's used in Jewish culture as a sacrifice to atone for sin. The one who sacrifices himself in God's kingdom is the one who deserves honor glory, and power, and strength. Now this crowd comes out of the Great Tribulation. If we kept reading, that's what the angel says to the person writing Revelation. Now I'm not following this whole left-behind sort of way of interpreting it. Rather, the Great Tribulation, I believe, is rather the persecution that happens to the church, not at the end of time, but throughout its time. These people are the people not who've accomplished great military victories on, account, or on behalf of Jesus, but people who have sacrificed themselves in a way that is similar to Jesus. Now, the kings of this world surround themselves with aristocrats, the people from the greatest families, with plutocrats, the people who come from the wealthiest background, with technocrats, the people who have the greatest expertise and the greatest wisdom, and with military commanders who've accomplished the greatest military victories, but in this kingdom, the Lamb is the one who sits on the throne, and those who follow 
and surround his throne are those who, like the Lamb, have sacrificed themselves for others. This is a very different kingdom indeed. Jesus' signs of restoration, of mercy, of healing, of forgiveness, point to this kind of kingdom and this kind of kingship. But his opponents here are looking the other way because they expect a different sort of kingdom. At the center of this disconnect about what it means to be the Messiah lies a dispute about the very nature of God. Now, the Old Testament is the story of God revealing himself to his people, Israel. And so as Israel has more and more interactions with God, they have a clearer and clearer picture of who God is, culminating, of course, in Jesus. And so when we read the early books in the Old Testament, oftentimes God is presented as someone who looks more like an ancient Near Eastern warrior deity. But as Israel has greater experience with their God, they begin to understand more nuance about who he is. There begin to arise different portraits of God that don't, don't, that don't coincide very easily with this picture of God, the mighty smiter of sinners. David, the great warrior, king, and poet of Israel, often writes about God in very militaristic and powerful terms, but sometimes he writes about God in very intimate and pastoral ways. In his most famous psalm, the 23rd Psalm, David says this, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside the peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessing. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Now this counter-narrative, this view that God is maybe a little different than what people might expect, comes into clearest focus in the suffering servant sections of Isaiah the prophet. In Isaiah 53, 5, we read, But he, the suffering servant, was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sin. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. Skipping a little bit ahead to verses 11 and 12, we read, When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted as righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. So this servant is honored not for crushing rebels in a mighty display of power, but for interceding for rebels in a display of sacrificial love. This, of course, would appear to be weakness in Jesus' culture, and yet in this kingdom it is considered strength. When Jesus says that he and the Father are one, Jesus is saying that this is who God is and what God is like. Jesus isn't the good cop to the Father's bad cop. When people see this suffering king who gives himself on behalf of sinners, they are seeing the very heart of the God that they have always worshipped revealed in its greatest clarity. So when we understand that God is the one who suffers and that his ultimate goal is to restore his creation back into fellowship, even if it costs him something, even if it costs him everything, then this kind of king and this kind of kingdom makes sense. But Jesus' opponents can't see it. They're too busy pursuing what they think God should be doing to actually pay attention to what God, in fact, is doing. Now, when we read Scripture, it's easy for us to identify with the more sympathetic characters. 
But I think sometimes the most fruitful contemplation of Scripture is when we understand the ways in which we are like the characters who come across not so, not so good. These characters, these opponents of Jesus, are meant to serve as cautionary tales to us because while we pursue what we believe God is doing, God might be doing something else entirely. That we have to surrender our expectations to the Lord whose kingdom doesn't always look like the one that aligns with our own agenda. You know, we can reduce God to justify our politics. So, for example, on the left, in this day and age, it seems like God is portrayed as a person, as a God who cares about injustice and alleviating poverty and oppression. But he doesn't really have anything to say about a person's sin, as if God doesn't care about the decisions that any individual makes. And on the right, we see sort of the mirror image of this. That God cares deeply about our personal morality, but doesn't seem to care at all about injustice or systems of, of oppression. Well, maybe both of these contain some truth, but also both of these cut off a part of who God is and what God expects in order to justify a political position that maybe we are more loyal to than to God himself. The church can end up opposing God in pursuing its own agenda and not realizing that not only are we not going where God wants us to go, but we're actually actively working against him. I see this most clearly in the church's relationship with power. In the last two generations, the church has gone from being at the center of public life to the margins. And we as Christians often bemoan this transition. We look longingly to the past and say, if only things were like they were back then. If only we still had the prestige and the seat at the table, then things would be better. And so we engage in what is often dubious political machinations in order to restore our power as if the ends justify the means. For the first three centuries of its existence, the church lived as a marginalized community. And God transformed the world through the church. But in the fourth century, the church became a legalized entity within the Roman Empire and very quickly went from being legal to the official religion of the Roman Empire. And when the church and the state climbed into bed together, bad things happened. When the church was a persecuted minority, when following Jesus might end in your death, you really had to kind of want to do that. You had to actually be willing to follow Jesus because there are better ways of living your life if you're not committed to Jesus than putting yourself at constant risk. But suddenly, when Christianity became not a persecuted minority, but rather a way of achieving personal power, people who didn't care a whit about anything Jesus said are joining the church in droves because they're loyal to their own ambitions. And so the witness of the church suffers as a result. And what's more, when the church partners up with the state, the church gets power. But the state wants something in return. The state expects the church then to legitimate its activities, especially the dubious ones. We see this right now going on in Russia. Vladimir Putin has begun a war of aggression against the Ukrainian people. And the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church in Moscow is acting as his cheerleader because his interests are too tightly aligned with the interests of the state. And so he finds himself unable or unwilling to be a countercultural voice, exercising the church's prophetic role to speak truth to power. And so perhaps... It's not godless secularists who are pushing the church from the center of the life of our community to its margins. Instead, perhaps, it is God himself. God is bringing the church low because when the church is humbled and still accomplishes things through their faithfulness to Jesus, then it is God who receives the glory. Remember the Old Testament story of Gideon. 
A man born to an unremarkable family who then takes an, a small army up against the Midianites. He starts out with an army that's too small to defeat them, and God whittles it down till he's only got 300 men against 120,000 Midianites, and he wins the battle. When God wins the battle, when there are impossible odds, God receives the glory. Perhaps, perhaps God is trying to use a church that has been humbled a church that has been stripped of its power and its privilege so that he can accomplish things and he can receive the glory for those things. And so when we try to hold on to what was ours because it was comfortable, because it was familiar, because we like power, we may find ourselves working against God rather than working alongside him. Now, this is all bad news. Is there good news? Yes, there is good news. We are pursuing a kingdom that is far too small. Oftentimes, we look at the world and we look at the ways that it's not functioning. And we think if we could just give a nick there and a tuck there, that things would be good. And so we pursue a world that looks an awful lot like the world now, just a little bit better. But Paul says that God is able to do far more than we ask or imagine. And so while we can't articulate the greatness of God's coming kingdom, we can trust that it will be quite mind-blowing. Now, personally, I can think of some pretty cool stuff. Calorie-free donuts, anyone? But whenever I try to envision God's kingdom and imagine what he might work, I am not doing it justice. If I roll up my greatest joy, my greatest pleasure, my greatest fulfillment, my greatest sense of belonging, the greatest fun that I've ever had, if I, if I roll those all up into one thing and use that as my barometer for what God's kingdom might be like, I'm going to fall far short of what God is going to achieve. And so God has something wonderful for us if we can trust that he will bring that about. If we can trust that even though we haven't seen it, it will be epic. But in God's wisdom, God has determined that the way that that reality comes into existence is not by giving Christians more power to go out and conquer evil, but by stripping them of power and conquering evil in the same way that Jesus conquered evil. Not through the power of conquest, but through the power of sacrificial love and humble service. Do we trust God enough to follow him when he says that that is the road to the kingdom that is greater than we can ask or imagine? That's what God has in store for us. Let's trust him. Trust that we can experience the kind of world that God longs for us to have.